Um, I want to talk about game changers now and the disruption. We've seen Richard Branson, um, the creation of, of sectors of business that nobody thought possible, um, the, the possibility of bringing peace in wartime or, or changing the way world events happen. Those are game changers, and many of them have been dyslexic, and many of them here that are going to be on this panel can talk about how dyslexics can contribute to that. Take a look. Made by Dyslexia's aim is to highlight the positive side of dyslexia, the strengths that are associated with dyslexia. We're aware that there are issues in education and how education is focusing on the deficit and the difficulties. But that's also the case in the workforce where people are more focused on the things that dyslexics can't do than they are focused on the things that they can. So we wanted to change that with, with some research and with some evidence that actually really looked at the positives and the strengths. The value of dyslexia report is a report we wrote with Made by Dyslexia. And what we wanted to achieve was to primarily change perceptions of dyslexia. We looked at what the World Economic Forum was saying about future skills required. Now we take those future skills required and then we map them against the strengths that dyslexic individuals have. We found that dyslexic strengths align to core work-related skills and abilities of the future. So if you're an organization that needs big problem-solving skills, needs creativity, these individuals that can do detail, but then step back and see a vision, well, then I think dyslexic individuals have something to offer to your organization. There's maybe one last thing as well I'd suggest. Leaders standing up and welcoming their input, praising them explicitly, making sure they feel comfortable about talking about their dyslexic traits is also a major part of the journey. And it strikes me if today we were to employ superwoman, what we wouldn't do is complain that she can't handle kryptonite. We'd look at how good she is and all the wonderful other things she does, but we'd never, never really draw attention to that kryptonite is not her thing. Surely that's a job that all of us have to do with our dyslexic colleagues. So that is a little bit of the detail on the latest EY report on the value of dyslexia, and I know it was released today. It's fascinating reading. It's on the Made by Dyslexia website, and I think... A lot of the copies will be available after this as well. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about that with this next panel. So I want to introduce everyone, please. Jeremy Fleming, the director of GCHQ, um, is going to be joining us. So to Nick Jones, the founder of Soho House. Steve Hatch, the, the vice president of Facebook uh, Northern Europe. Also Richard Addison, a partner at EY and very much part of this EY value of dyslexia report. And also Laura Powell, who's the global head of uh, HR for retail banking and can talk about what big companies are looking for and how skills can fit in. So thanks so much. Join us. Snuggle in. <laughs> there we go. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to start with Richard because we've just had a little taste of this new report. And it's important for a variety of reasons. But what it says is that dyslexic skills are needed for future jobs. And a lot of the dyslexic weaknesses are being replaced by technology. So that kryptonite, um, you know, is, is being re is replaced by, by sort of technology that can help. So why is that important? I think it's very hard to, for us to imagine what the future work really looks like. And when, you do, when we do that, I, th I think we often think simplistically about this job will stop. You know, accountants won't be needed or a lawyer doing a conveyancing won't be needed. And what I, th I think the future is much more complex than that. There's augmentation of human inputs with machines. And then to actually understand how we fit into that future, what Ben Cook has done an amazing job of, is to break that down into the abilities, the skills, and really align to what is trending and what is uh, decreasing. And dyslexics fit very well naturally with those areas that are trending and those areas where we've, not, where we've always battled a bit are being supported by that uh, technology augmentation. Um, and that's not just about sort of assessing something on paper. I know GCHQ... Um, is very much focused on using the dyslexic brain 
in these ways, to troubleshoot on, on a lot of things. Very important security issues. Tell us why you're being so forward thinking on this. Well, absolutely. We, we have a uh, hundred years of keeping the country safe. And when I look at the things that ordinary people have done that have ended up with extraordinary outcomes, then I can see people who think differently and I can see dyslexics in every one of those from 1919 through to the present day. And when I look at how we think of that community in our workforce, when I think about how we make sure that they can give their best, there are a few lessons I think that we can learn from that. I talk about, with the right mix of minds, anything is possible. And dyslexics are definitely part of those mix of minds. Mm -hmm. And we are doing everything we can to attract the right people, including dyslexics, to make sure that they see themselves through the recruitment process, to make sure that when they get to us, they can fulfill their potential and that they can set an example to the broader workforce out there too, to give something back to their community. Yeah, and I want to break that down a little bit later, but in terms, we've got, we've got the HR guru here, and in terms of the <laughs> recruiting process, how do you encourage this diversity of thought? Um, and why are these dyslexic skills so important, even for HSBC? So I've spent a lot of time looking at the World Economic Forum Future Skills Report, mm -hmm. and it's really fascinating to me that the, the skills that are required for the future are very, very similar across all countries and also across all industries. So it really doesn't matter which industry you're looking at or which country. Those types of skills around problem solving, big picture thinking, empathy skills, creative innovation um, approaches to how you're looking at problems, they're the sorts of things that are really coming out clearly in that report. And this is only two or three years away. It's not, you know, we're talking 10 to 15 years away. So I'm recently um, new to HSBC. I joined four months ago, but having had a dyslexic daughter or have a dyslexic daughter and seeing some of the struggles she's had, to me, this is critical that we start to look at this from an employer's perspective. And I think listening to what Richard said about the system is broken and seeing what my daughter is experiencing, I think it is broken. So the power, I think, is for us as employers to be able to really start to stand out and talk about these are the skills that we're looking for. These are skills that dyslexic people very commonly have abilities and capabilities around. And we're looking now at how we can introduce that much more into our assessment processes. To be fair, our assessment processes are not about exam results. They're much broader than that. But what we want to continue to do is to look much, much more closely at these future skills and make sure that the people that we're bringing in have those skills. But we also want people to feel confident to talk to us about the fact that they are dyslexic. So the question about should that be on CVs or should that be on application processes, I don't think it has to be. People need to feel comfortable to do that. But it's absolutely critical, I think, that we're aware and that we can help support people in the right direction. We had a LinkedIn video that we posted earlier this year. It had the most views that of any of our videos that we posted on LinkedIn this year, and it was about neurodiversity mm -hmm. and had colleagues talking about their experiences. That's fascinating. Um, Nick? You wouldn't be caught dead working for any big company, would you? No, definitely not. <laughs> I don't think anyone would have me. No, and that perhaps is the, the, the reason yeah. you started your own so. I don't think I would have got... Yeah, no. yeah. Talk us through your experience of starting a business and how in many ways your attributes of being dyslexic has helped you be an extremely successful entrepreneur. Well, I, I, I sort of think... I mean, I, I think, first of all, I'm, I'm very lucky I'm dyslexic because I do look at things very differently. And... But I never, when I, when I went in, I mean, if those of you who don't know what Soho House is, it's catering, it's a members club, it's, there's a few of them around, around the world. And, but I, I, I sort of went, went into it because catering was, when I was at school, my um, careers master looked at me and looked at all possible options for me and it, he said it was catering. Catering was the only thing I could possibly get into. Um, and... That was a very long time ago. It was like 35 years ago. And, and the catering wasn't a great industry to get into 35 years ago. So it was, I thought, okay, well, I'll go and do catering. Everyone's got to eat and drink. And I imagine they will keep on eating and drinking for the rest of our, our time. And so that's why I went into it. And then I realised that actually it would be sensible to try and do it on your own. And, and I think being dyslexic was 
I think the biggest thing dyslexic gives to me is I, I have to simplify everything. Yeah. And as soon as any of it, I think the world, all it does is try and overcomplicate everything, you know. And, and I, 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 complication panics me. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 it sends me into a, 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 a bad place. So all I do is spend my life simplifying. And I think what I've done is just send, set up a very simple business, which is hopefully giving food and drink to people in a nice environment that people enjoy. And that's it, start and finish. Um, and, you, and you're so right about constantly simplifying. I know television news, and I know a lot of people might have heard me say this, is a dyslexic dream job in many ways because you don't have to spell. You're reading your own scripts. The scripts are very, very short. Um, and you're having to hone a lot of global issues into one or two main points. And, you know, I think there, there's a natural pathway for many people who are dyslexic, who think in pictures, who want to tell stories. You'll find a lot of that's probably in, in, in television news and trying to communicate simply to an audience of what is important, what do they need to know. Um, Facebook, though, is also changing the way we communicate in many ways, good and bad. Um, how, how are you managing with the potential of, of dyslexic skills and incorporating yeah. that? Yeah, um, and the, uh, in terms of an audience, I mean, in terms of the community that we serve, Globally, that's close on 2.6 billion yeah. people now. And when you're making when you're making products for the world, you are making products for 2.6 billion, of which we know a huge number of those will be dyslexic, a huge number of those will be have hearing loss, a huge number of those will have visual impairment. So we have to think about how do we build products that are able to be used by everybody on an equal basis. And the way that we think about it is on two for one is is diversity. And I and I. I don't want to declare the diversity debate over, but my goodness, like if you're in business and you haven't got this yet, the kind of diversity is a strength, then, well, good for you, because it's going to be my competitive advantage yeah. if you haven't. But I think kind of more needs perhaps to be done on the inclusion. Like there's one thing having people in the business. Why I'm just so impressed with the work that EY have done and what GCHQ are doing, that, it's, it, it, that, you, that people feel they can thrive in those roles. And I think that's where when you have a position of responsibility and you have a degree of power to some extent, that you should be able to be much more open around uh, dyslexia in particular. Um, I certainly try and do that. Um, technology has helped some of that. Spell check is great. Mm -hmm. it, you do need allies, though, sometimes. I do remember when I wrote a reference for someone and there was a very concerned um, reply from the company he was going to and where I thought I'd written, I'm sure this person will thrive at your company, I'd written, I'm sure that person will thieve at your company, which is not, <laughs> which is not what I meant at all, you know, at all. So, like, occasionally I kind of pull on my allies to go, can you just have a quick read of this before it goes out? And I think that, you know, the more that we can model that, the better that's going to be for everyone. And, and do you also have a little addendum at the bottom of your email? I do, yeah. So at the bottom of my email, um, it says, TFAC says, I'm dyslexic, please excuse any typos, and... Maybe I don't have to apologise for that, but I, but I think it's courteous too. Um, and, then, and then I have the madebydyslexia.org. And what's been remarkable is just how many times I've had people just reply, often unexpectedly, saying, thank you that that's there. I didn't know that. And interestingly, how, and kind of huge credit to the work that Kate and the whole team do here, how often that comes from, from people that live in countries outside of the UK. I mean, you know, the minister's absolutely right. We've got a lot to do but we shouldn't ignore like, the really significant progress that's been made in this country. And I want to talk about this inclusion uh, that you are very much uh, leading the way in. Give us some examples. I, I, know, I know that you can't be very specific, <laughs> um, but how would dyslexics contribute to the, the work of intelligence gathering and securing the nation? So look, we're a really complicated business. We're a big technology business we deal with big data, we're in 20 places around the UK, we're a global business. And so what I say to my workforce the whole time is, look, we're complicated, but let's not overcomplicate it. Let's simplify it. I really identify with some of the things the other panel members have been saying here, and I identify and value the skills that my dyslexic and neurodiverse community can bring to help me do that. Now, GCHQ uh, is a, a very broad business too. So I, I have uh, ev everyone from uh, the, the country's best mathematicians through some of our most talented engineers and hopefully some of our best analysts. But I also have people who are keeping the show on the road, who are making the machine work. 
who are, who are making sure that we are giving of our best every day. And I can see dyslexics in every bit of the business. Now, we, uh, we specifically, in some of our campaigns around analytical skills, are looking for people with that sort of neural difference. But we don't just stick at that. And then we make sure that the processes we have that uh, attract them, often at a very early age, so we're, uh, we're in and around schools. We have um, a very prominent cyber schools um, program nowadays. We do apprenticeships, and our, apprentices, our apprenticeship schemes, uh, we have, we think, three times the nat national average for dyslexics in our apprentice uh, uh, schemes. And so we're, we are actively trying to go out and, uh, and attract people into the workforce so that they can try. We call it try before we buy. I think it works both ways. But it means that we are much more recruiting on potential than we are on exam results nowadays, for example. And just to follow up, when we look at the Value for Dyslexia report and we look at um, the dyslexic strengths, how do they actually impact um, intelligence gathering or, or how you see threats, for, for example? Is it the big picture thinking? Is it What, what is it? So I, I think it's really hard to overcharacterize this. Yeah. But some of the things that uh, the previous panel said and this panel have said around joining the dots, about simplification, about being the, the bigger, uh, seeing the bigger picture, but also probably a skill that we haven't talked about much today, T team working. I mean, I, 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 an organization of 10,000 people, small compared to uh, Facebook and, 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 Ernst and Ernst and Young, but still a big business. And nothing happens in my business unless we work properly as teams. So some of the characteristics I see in our, our neurally diverse and our dyslexic workforce are really at the core of how we team work too. Okay. Can I just build yeah. a little bit on that as well? Absolutely. And I think kind of, and there's a particular aspect of teamwork which has come through in the EY report and I see this in, in my own experience as well, which is that of leadership. That that ability to simplify, to find a narrative, to be able to create followership around you and kind of increasingly Businesses are really complex, which means that you have to increasingly operate in what's called matrix levels. So you have to bring people from different teams together around a common goal. And I've had experience over experience over experience of how dyslexia is just really good at that because they can recognize the skills of others, they can find a narrative way through, and they can be open to bring in the experts when they need it. So, I mean, I was really super pleased to see so many kind of, I think, kind of school uh, school folk in the queue made me feel a bit intimidated, but you know, I hope they <laughs> hope they take away like you know, the, the the gift that you have and its ability to create the you and leadership roles is is there, and it's a very very strong element of dyslexic capability. Yeah, and I want to explore that a little bit more, and also the issue of failure and how that perhaps helps, uh, which we talked with Richard about. But just give us a little bit more detail on this on this report and and. What is another salient point that you think people, when they read it, because it's it's quite a lot of reading, um, <laughs> go on, help us. Well, I, th I think it, everything that we've spoken about here comes out, and I think the key areas to look at they're, they're tasks, and you also have skills. And although I'd like people to say I'm dyslexic in their CV, I think it's much more important that they can articulate what they bring to a team. Mm -hmm how they're going to work in a team. They can explain to other people how to get the best out of them. And also, the way that they'll work requires accommodations from other, other people. This sort of, say, lack of structure, perhaps a scientific way of thinking, have a go, I have another go. The rest of the team doesn't always, it doesn't always work for, for everyone. So people need to understand what dyslexia really is. They need to understand a bit more deeply what it is. And dyslexics also need to know how to communicate. And I think once that happens, you can get teams that gel. I mean, we had a problem with the report in that we had a very, very dyslexic team. <laughs> <laughs> and at a stage, Ben and I said, we need some non-dyslexics to get this. <laughs> to get this. <laughs> So if there, yeah, I, I, and that's what Richard Branson was saying is that you, you know, you sometimes have to call in the troops, um, yeah. and that involves double checking on. Mm. Simplest, simple things like spell check or just giving a, you know, giving you a little rating. And making sure we didn't go back to the beginning and start again to see if we could make it better. There we go. <laughs> I'm surprised it was so long. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, when we talk about teams gelling and being, and, and having, if you've got to Facebook or HSBC or one of these big companies, there's perhaps a leadership um, aspect. 
Do you think the issue of failure, perhaps early struggles at school, make a lot of successful dyslexic, as I described to Richard earlier, street fighters, and that is useful in the modern workplace? Nick, I wouldn't... Well, I, I think failure is, is, is a good thing. I, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think, and, and I don't think failure should be deemed as a failure. It should be deemed as just a part of a journey. And I think when you... I've had plenty of failures and I make plenty of mistakes and I think what you've got to do is just look at them and, and, and say, OK, well, I won't do that again. I'll do it slightly differently. And I, I think it's a shame when people fail at something. They think they're just useless and they can't do anything. And I, I think it does make you more robust because when you were at school and, and, and it, was, it was more... I was lucky. I was, I was diagnosed with dys dyslexia at a very early age so I'm not I'm not like so many people who don't get it uh, diagnosed until a very late date and I, I think I, I think you do you 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 are more determined because everything is slightly more challenging and you look at things differently and you look at how you can get around a problem rather than and because you, you, there are so many issues at school so you're always trying to avoid yeah. them which is a great advantage in later life. Yeah, as I say, you take a different route yeah. to get to the same place yeah. as everybody else. Might take a little bit longer, but you get there eventually. Yeah. Um, in a workplace, as as you're looking at a lot of these skills that are outlined, what are the what do you take in terms of hiring people, and and is the process of hiring people a problem, and how do you change that? Psychosymmetric tests, tests. Um, how does that how does that need to change? So I think it's Can relevant. It yeah, I think it's a relevant point for all employers, and I think employers are on a journey. So I think some of them are far more advanced in their thinking around this, and others still are much more at the you know high levels of assessment, looking at um, background results, looking at exam results. Um, I mean, psychometrics in themselves don't necessarily look at actual um, numeracy or, or verbal abilities. They're much more about per people's personalities. I think the question is more around things like numerical reasoning and some of those types of tests. So I think a lot of employers have started to take those out because if you look at the future skills agenda, it's going to be much more about what skills you bring to the table, not what your exam history is. And I think that becomes more and more apparent as you look at these types of roles that are, you know, new roles that are being created around things like machine learning and AI and big data, that it's far less about whether you've got a certain number of A-levels or what your degree was. It's about whether you can bring those skills. And I think from a future perspective, that will really start to change the workplace as well. So it'll be far less about what jobs you've done and much more about what skills you're bringing to the table. And I think it's going to be a really interesting dynamic for a lot of the more traditional companies who are organised in quite major hierarchies that these things need to start to change as we begin to work in much more agile, flat structures in companies than they have been traditionally used to doing. Um, recruiting. How, how have you taken out some of the tricky test scores and um, the old way of judging whether somebody is worth being an analyst or one of, one of your computer gurus? So we spend a lot of time up front thinking about the core of the role. So, so what is it we are actually trying to attract here? What are the skills, to your mm. point, that we actually need? And then think deeply about the process we need to get the right people in. And the, the end result is often, of course, not a psychometric test. It's a different type of pro, uh, uh, process which tests much more on aptitude. But we, we then also make the process um, quite touch heavy, if I can say that in the right. What do you in mean? The right. Well, I mean, we, we stay in contact. We, we talk um, a lot to our people about what, it, what they should expect in the process and what's coming up. And then, particularly for GCHQ, where we have a vetting requirement on top, which yeah. can take several months beyond, we talk people through that to make sure they stay the course. A, um, uh, losing people at the late stage of the process is a really expensive thing. It's very wasteful of time. And so to make sure we get the right mix of minds at the end of that process, we invest very heavily through the process. Do you kind of back time it? Yeah, yeah, but you know we've got a long way to go on this too. I don't want anyone to, to go away thinking that we're perfect on this. We're learning about this the, uh, the whole time. But I think the overarching lesson here is the younger we go, the earlier we look for potential, the more we tailor the recruitment process and the outcome, the better minds we're getting at the end of it. How, how has Facebook, 
How is Facebook figuring out this identifying talent, letting them come through a process that could be in many ways, you know, daunting to a dyslexic? Uh, yeah, well, I hope uh, for everyone that has a recruitment experience with Facebook, it's not daunting, it's kind of a pleasant one, but mm -hmm. we definitely have a, have a rigorous process. And I think part of the, the, the drive towards making sure that you're seen as an employer of choice in a way for, in a way, the most diverse uh, group of people is being out there, actually. I, don't, I think actually the very first point is it's quite incredible for whom people wouldn't think naturally to that that, uh, that organization is right for them until they've seen somebody doing one of these, you know, until they've read an article that says we welcome people. And then it's also about talking about the internal environment. So we have lots of different groups within Facebook that help us work that out. So I look after the <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Um, so I'm the exec sponsor on the Differently Able group within, within Facebook. And it's incredible talking to people who are having that experience of saying, okay, what was it like for you? What could we improve? Who do you know? And whilst that's true in the world of kind of cognitive, direct cognitive or neurodiversity in that sense, it's also true in the other underrepresented groups. So people know the answers. you just got to be able to ask the right questions and make sure that you create a framework of support and interest as an organization that enables that to actually change how you do things. Uh, you, you talk about, I suppose, the issue of accommodation. So within, within a work environment, and I think a lot of dyslexics automatically figure out ways to accommodate your weaknesses. I know that I'm very grateful that I, I am not a newspaper reporter because I didn't spell subpoena right once through the Mueller report. Um, and, you know, that sort of stuff that, you know, perhaps you... You give a little bit of extra time, you know, in terms of delivering a, a paper or something. How how can companies actually physically right now accommodate dyslexics? I, I, I'll give just like maybe one kind of small practical example. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's about accommodating dyslexics, but this but it has a good positive side effect, mm -hmm. which is how companies communicate internally as well. And yeah, that can often be, previously that could be very heavy paper based or a lot of email, those things. Now increasingly you've seen lots of companies using video as a way of communicating either messages from leaders and how they exchange. And that has not only, that's not necessarily you might, something you might necessarily design for dyslexic, but it really does work for them and it brings everybody else around in the same. So I think the ability for companies to talk to themselves is really changing. And I think that those changes, I think of creating a more productive an inclusive environment, particularly for dyslexics. And is that dealt with in, in, in your report at all in terms of how companies can already work towards facilitating these future skills? I think it's, we've spoken a lot about the resilience of dyslexics. Yeah. And of course, that's something that's very important. But I think it's also, if we take a step back and say, if we create a psychologically safe environment, that is the environment which in which the dyslexics will be most successful. At the same time, that, that benefits all diversity and all neurodiversity. Mm -hmm. And you have this ability to build teams within which dyslexics really flourish, which are the more diverse teams. And so I think it's, it's creating that, env that environment which is, as you said, or more, less hierarchical, more skills-based, more agile. That benefits dyslexics enormously. But I think maybe I'd also just add, I mentioned earlier about this neurodiversity video that we posted on mm. LinkedIn. We had such a positive response, both externally from many, many people, but also internally. So it comes back to your point. It's like, you've, you know, you've just got to be open about these things and encourage people to feel comfortable so that they genuinely do bring them their whole selves to work. And then I think it's much easier for people to operate, feel comfortable and then talk about where they've got real strengths and where they maybe find things more difficult. So you can then more easily match teams together to, to manage that because everyone has their strengths and areas of development. Yeah. Um, Nick, in terms of you're at the top of that pyramid and you're dyslexic, how has that changed the way you've managed your company? Well, I think communication, work, workplace. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, which is, um, you know, which you communicate by mm -hmm. video. Um, I think... They're very lucky they don't get long emails from me. No one gets a look because I, <laughs> I, 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 I don't send any emails, really. Um, it, it, it's talking to people and communicating verbally. Um, and I, I, I think, I mean, you, you talk about recruitment processes and more time. I, I remember 
they gave me more time at school on my exams and it, that was a complete waste of time because I, I completely had run out of anything to say by the time the exam had finished. <laughs> then I spent half an hour just twiggling my thumb. <laughs> so um, more time isn't the answer. But I, I, I just think you just have to talk to people and you, and, and you just have to, in a business where, I mean, we all report to the customer. It's, 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 we, it's not about reporting to lots of people within our company. It's about the customer as a person that we... And, and, and just staying focused on what the simple, simple mission of what you're trying to do. And I think I saw somewhere that you only will read one page. If anybody gives you a wad of papers, you... Oh, no, no way. I mean, it's, 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 I, I wouldn't... I mean, if you can't put it on one page, it's... I'm, I'm sorry, I know you spend... No, no, no. You're speaking... I know you spend a lot of time on your... We have got the summary on the report. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, what, what? Yeah, what? Yeah, I mean, do you find the simplicity in terms of perhaps lessening paperwork? Is that is that a benefit? I went out in the civil service but, department. Yeah, I know, that's what I'm asking you. <laughs> so I was uh, hearing you talk about your, your, um, your focus on your customer, and there's a parody for GCHQ, which is always listening to our customers. But, <laughs> <laughs> but of course, that, that, that is... Mic drop, Absolutely <laughs> not, not the case. We've got Facebook. Yeah, yeah. That's definitely not us. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think we'll take that offline. But, but, um, there, are, there are two other things that I just wanted... I mean, the, the first is about awareness and understanding um, amongst the broad, broader, broader work, workplace. So uh, there's, I think all of us need to invest in understanding of inclusion full stop, and this is one of those inclusion um, issues. And, and the second is technology is, is providing us lots of opportunity to provide help in the workplace. So whether that's um, you know, extra sound baffling in our open plan offices or it's technology to help with some of the basics around grammar and spell checking or it's some of the ways we enable people to uh, take part in uh, meetings and, and, and there are fantastic opportunities out there with the technology we can bring to bear. But it's those two additional elements which we haven't talked about which I think are important. Um, I think we still have to start wrapping up. So I just wouldn't, wouldn't mind sort of a closing statement or just a sense of what you would give in terms of advice to anyone who is 16 and perhaps not doing so well in, in, in their exams or a university graduate who's very focused on a very narrow path of studying, which is also um, something. What, what would you tell people um, when they're coming, in, coming to your companies and, and, and perhaps looking for a job? Go for it. So I would say it's about thinking big picture and thinking broad and really trying to think about all of the different skills that you can bring to an organisation. What turns me off the most if someone sits in front of me and talks about their exam success? It's just not relevant to me. Or the university me. they went to. It's just not relevant. You know, if you want a, a, a diverse and inclusive organisation, you want people from all different walks of life. And what they bring into the organisation in terms of how they'll perform. I think the team working piece is huge people that can collaborate, people that have empathy, people that have emotional intelligence, people that can think big picture. These are all of the things that I'm looking for. We hire over 45,000 people a year in HSBC. So don't be put off by exam results. Focus on what you bring. And I think that's where you'll get success. OK, great. Yeah, I, I think I probably maybe view the exam results as, as maybe just sweetener. And I bring that up to say, mm -hmm. you know, the way that we operate as a company is we're a strengths-based organisation. Like we are, we do everything we absolutely can to push everything out of the way that stops you from using that particular strength that you have. And that's how you're assessed. It's not, you're not assessed on what you can't do. You're assessed at what you are absolutely brilliant, potentially the best in the world at. And, and I think I, I would encourage kind of anyone on that to, to really think about what that is, what they do, what, what is it that gives them joy? Where does their energy come from? And do not be distracted by those things that are necessarily uh, you perceive as your own weaknesses. Because if you can find what you are bloody brilliant at and you can make <laughs> that your thing, honestly, I mean, that's not just dyslexics, it's for everyone. But my mm. goodness, dyslexics have some amazing abilities that are so valuable. Focus on the strengths put people around you can help you on the other stuff. And I agree with you. I mean, I just look at my daughter even. I mean, she's really good at Lego. And you can see her 3D understanding of building 
just around Lego. And that, again, is, you know... Yeah, this is you not give, a you, question it's not of, like, about putting a, a, you know... Yeah. A school, when I was at school, they used to put a patch over your eye to try and strengthen the other one. Like, <laughs> actually, I just want to have an amazing super eye. Yeah. You know, that, that's, one kind of, yeah. that's kind of... There we go. Like, you know. So, yeah, focus on the strengths even when you're nine. Yeah. Um, and that's a good thing when, no matter what age you are. Yeah. Well, I think a, 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 a set of bad exam results is a good thing. So don't worry about it. anyone who's 16 just about to do that. Um, I, I, I've never asked anyone what exams they've got, what results they've got. Um, I, I think it's hard for people at school because there is such pressure on exam results. And I don't think it's necessarily the best way of judging if that person is good for a job or not. And I think the more it's really good to hear what everyone's saying on this panel, but they don't really look at it. So I just wish that that could be communicated because I would have never have thought getting a job in the bank, you didn't have to go to university or didn't have to get lots of exams to be able to get there. So, um, yeah, don't worry about it. Yes, spelling and punctuation, you know, are not that important. Um, in, in your business, what is your final message? So my, my simplified message is don't let anyone stop you from imagining better. Mm. Final word, Richard. I'll maybe turn it around a bit and okay. say when you're looking at the business, don't see the business of today or the business of yesterday. Think about what is going to be in the future. Mm. And then also when you're looking at people, you might have an old person like me with a tie, but I feel like an outsider very often in my organization. I'm dyslexic and I don't feel like I fit a lot of the time. You're just talking to people. Mm. I think that's a really good piece of advice. Um, thank you all. It's been fascinating. And, and I know we've focused on the positives. Um, after the break, we are going to talk about some of the challenges, I think, and, and what the school system needs to do um, to encourage people and not limit sort of you in a box of where spelling, for example, or a test result is going to make or break your life. Um, but to all of you, thank you. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.